Hello, hello. My name is Olivia. Uh, I have been here with Impact for almost two years now, and my whole area of focus since joining has been creators and influencer marketing. So I'm really, really excited to be here and to start doing some programming specifically for creators and people who work with creators to better understand how to collaborate and how to forge really successful partnerships. Molly is here. Hi, Molly. Welcome. Hello. I figure we can just uh, get started. If you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, like where you come from and uh, a little bit about your influencer journey, maybe. Okay. I am Molly from Molly the Mom. Um, I started in on TikTok back in 2019. Um, I had seen somebody on Instagram post a TikTok and I was like, that's the place that I need to be. So I hopped on there, um, started all for fun. And once Instagram hit, started doing reels, someone was like, you need to jump into that space and just move your TikToks over to reels. And that blew up. I never thought Instagram was going to be my place. And now I feel like it's more of my place than TikTok. So how interesting. I love that. I love hearing how people leverage multiple platforms because I think that that's um, kind of a, a unique um, landscape that we all kind of are faced with. We have really, really strong platforms, but in very, very different ways. And I think that the vibes are really unique and like that sense of community that you're building, I think it really can differ from platform to platform. Um, so I love hearing <laughs> a little bit about how you how you approach that. Um, so anyway, let's start diving into our main content for the day, which is all about going viral. Like I think uh, as marketers, from my perspective, as content creators, maybe as an aspiring content creator, people often think that like going viral, getting one shot at going viral is like your ticket to success, right? Um, and so we wanna kind of demystify that a little bit. Like, is that actually true? And if it is, like, how do we go about trying to make sure that we um, use that opportunity to its full potential? Um, let's dive in and I'm interested to like, maybe start with a little story time. If you can tell us about like your first big taste of success, like what video did you have that, you know, you remember really blowing up first? Were you expecting it to blow up? And then like, what did you do immediately following that? Okay. I, like I said, I started just for fun. I think my, like, I even went back and checked. I think it was like my 15th video on TikTok. Um, I don't know if you remember, there's a lot of like couples challenges back in the day. And um, <laughs> me and my husband saw the koala challenge and I was like, we got this. Like, we're going to do this. And that one, it went to like half a million. And that was, it was like crazy. Cause I had just started. I was like, what is even happening? My other videos were at maybe 1000 views. Um, and then like a week later, I started just doing daily. I was like, okay, this is fun. Once you get the hint of that viral, there's like, we're going to keep doing this. Like this is going to hit again. And sometimes it doesn't, but that next week I did just this dumb video about how boys use hampers which number one, um, a lot of the viral, I guess, virality of it was people correcting me that it's not a hamper. People call it other things. I don't know. I called it a hamper. So a lot of comments on that, but um, it just showed like a three-year-old throwing it on the hamper and it was on the ground. A 10-year-old throwing in the hamper on the ground all the way up to my husband who's in his 30s, throwing it and it's on the ground inside out, underwear attached. And so I think that one went viral just because of the re relatableness of it. Um, and then I had another one hit soon after that was one about, um, I had all, I have four kids. Um, and at the time they were all pretty dang young. I only had three at the time when I started, but they were definitely in that phase, which they still are even at 10, eight, six, and three, where they say, you know, hey mom, Hey mom, 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 hey mom, you know, and they show you the, the dumbest little thing that you're just like, yay, good job. So that one went viral. And I think, like I said, it's all about people relating to that. Cause if you're a parent, you know, that that happens often. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I don't actually even have kids, but I find your content incredibly relatable. 
um maybe it's just being married to a guy <laughs> like yeah that's the element they have the same <laughs> tendencies at times so <laughs> hey everybody uh Rhea has finally been able to join uh so please uh welcome her with me um Rhea we were just kind of diving in a little bit into like the very beginnings of Molly's kind of viral success um and so why don't we shift you for a second introduce yourself tell us a little bit about your your journey and and uh your content okay um well it's nice to meet both of you and everybody that's watching um so my journey had a lot of i wouldn't say ups and downs a lot of turns that happened i didn't start off automatically saying that i wanted to do content creation it was um, the pandemic, and I was trying to open a restaurant, and I was also pregnant. I had a lot of things going on at that time, and I wasn't able to do any of that because of COVID-19. And I, I feel like my husband and I kind of just needed an outlet to express how we felt and the fact that we just invested all this money in a business that we weren't able to open. And we took to social media in order to express that. And the people were so loving and warm and just like open to hearing our story, but we didn't realize how much it resonated until the day we were actually able to open our business and the lines were around the corner, around the block. And that was the first time I was able to see the power and the impact of social media. But because I was just opening a, a restaurant, which is very hard and having kids, I took a back seat when it came from content creation and I didn't pursue pursue it again until probably like two years after that. How interesting. Um, I love that. It's almost like you had a reverse viral experience where all of the work that you put in on social media in the virtual world turned into like IRL success. That's like pretty cool. Um, so I already kind of asked Molly this question. Let's let's give you a chance to to answer. Um, let's do a story time about your very first like video that or piece of content online on social that you remember blowing up or like maybe going viral. Um, was it something that you were expecting? Did it take you by surprise? And like, what did you do immediately following that like initial taste of like, oh my gosh, I might have gone viral here. <laughs> So I actually did a trend, a dancing trend. I feel like dancing trends will always work. <laughs> um, I was actually nine months pregnant at the time as well. I'm always pregnant. I don't know why. <laughs> I was nine months pregnant at the time. And I decided to surprise my husband while he was in the kitchen and do the TikTok dance. And it kind of startled him a little bit and the milk fell all over him. And I honestly did it out of fun. And I had no expectations for the video. I wasn't even going to post it. And then I saw it was going viral, but I was so mesmerized by the fact that it was going viral. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like I didn't do the steps that I would have done now. And I was more so commenting and laughing and cracking up with everybody in the, in the comments, which is great too, but I wasn't thinking, okay, what do I do now? Yeah. Well, I think that's like a hundred percent kind of why we're having this conversation, right? is this idea that sometimes I think actually maybe a majority of the time you don't expect it. Like, I think when I see content creators come on and be like, oh my gosh, I didn't expect that to blow up the way it did. So here's my follow-up, you know? Um, so let's, let's talk all among us about like, what would you do differently? What do you think is like important for people to keep in mind if they have a piece of content blowing up to like kind of keep that momentum? Mm hmm. I would say try your best to recreate the wheel, especially if you don't know what exactly caused it. It could have been the sound. It could have been your actions. You don't know. So I would say to try and mimic it as best as you can. But of course, having something that's differentiating. So it's it doesn't seem as though that you are repeating it. So, for instance, if you are if the video was you getting ready maybe do another video of you getting ready, but just change the hairstyle or just change. Obviously, I hope you change the outfit, like just change something in it so that it's different, but it still feels the same to kind of feed the appetite for the people that are currently coming on your page. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think, Molly? Um, I think I think that's great. I also think um, consistency. Like you said, you don't know you never know what's going to go viral. Like, you know, the things that will kind of continue. So, of course, keep doing those. But you've got to try other things like trends and try-ons. And it might not be 
exactly what you're used to with your content. But like, like we know viral content is just out of the blue. You're like a dance goes viral or are you trying on some random thing goes viral or trying a different food? Like it just seems so out there what end up ends up going viral. So it's just consistently consistency, like posting those videos as much as you can. Yeah. And I feel like you both have done a pretty good job of like finding a, a niche, like a, like a home in your content, whether that's like the tone, the formula of like what you say and, or when you post certain types of content, um, things like that. But I'm interested to know, like, um, have you had, have you had to do some trial and error as far as like, okay, I am going to um, try this new content formula and it doesn't seem to be hitting and I don't know why. Like, what do you do to reflect and then develop a new a new plan to kind of try and keep your momentum going? Yeah, absolutely. I would say that as I began the journey and I really wanted to understand the minds of the people that decided to follow me as I go on this journey, I started tweaking a lot more. I feel like I tried multiple different scripts to see, okay, what do they like? Do they like the get ready with me? Do they like me cooking dinner? Do they like me doing X, Y, Z? And then once something does go viral, it's like, okay, what was the specific thing about this right here? So I'll use a get ready with me. Sorry, no, I'll use a daily vlog as an example because it's something that I have actually done where the first one I did, it was very successful, but I had a lot of different things going on. So the second one, I'm like, okay, instead of me ending the video with me getting, putting on an outfit, I'm going to end the video with me making breakfast. And I noticed that one, it performed good, but it didn't perform as well. So I tried a different variation. And at the end of all of that, I noticed, okay, it seems like what they were actually really attracted to was the fashion. Does that now mean I need to start doing a little bit more fashion content? So a lot of that, a lot of those kinds of conversations I have with myself in order to keep expanding. How about you, Molly? Um, I think a lot of it too, is you've got to realize that people are following you for you. They want your personality. So you can be doing all these different things, but you've always got to add your personality. Like when I'm doing dancing, I'm not going to, I, number one, I'm not a great dancer. So I have to add my flair to it, which is my face. Like I always make faces and I think that's what people comment on. That's what people like. They're like, you know, I'm a true millennial. We have to do the stank face while we dance. Like that's what people <laughs> cling on to. So you might be doing things that are like out of your comfort zone, but you always need to bring yourself into that. I remember when I first had like my first brand deal or something and I was trying to be so like kind of serious and adsy and it did not do well, surprisingly, because I was not adding my personality and myself into it. A hundred percent. Like when I, when I talk to brands about working with creators, um, that's something that I always try to stress um, is like, hey, your creator partners are the absolute experts in their audience. They know, they understand like why they keep coming back or at least they should, right? Um, and so you, you need to trust them and let them like, you know, because a lot of brands, when it comes to like brand safety, they get really precious about it and nervous, which is totally understandable. Brand safety is like very important. Um, but you know, you don't want to like script it. It's not, it's not a television advertisement. This is a real person talking to other real people about why they see value in X, Y, and Z. Um, and so, yeah, I try to always stress that. <laughs> um, so now let's talk a little bit about like more like the challenge side of it. So as your success and your audiences have grown over time, um, talk about like, you know, what big challenges have kind of, you know, risen to the surface for you, how you juggle content creation, like especially keeping a schedule and staying consistent when you both, I know, have busy families, staying organized, stuff like that. Um, you. Go ahead. Dive okay. <laughs> I was just going to say it definitely can get overwhelming at times. You know, I did this for fun. I started for fun. The monetization now is of course, wonderful, but that's the part that gets a little overwhelming for me because I'm not used to it. Um, so just 
find help. Like I'm good at content creation. I am not good at organizing. Like I am not good at planning my time. And so I, or setting up systems, I had somebody come up and set up a system for me that has like my content calendar where I can put all my collabs in. Um, they set up a system that puts in like um, what the contracted amount that I'm supposed to get from each of these places, just making sure all these places are paying me. Um, and then I, I tell my talent agent right away, right? When we started, I said, I am all over the place. Like that is just my personality. I know my strengths and weaknesses. Like I said, being organized and remembering stuff, I'm getting better, but definitely one of my weaknesses. So I told her from the start, every Monday, send me <laughs> an email saying this needs done, this needs done, this needs done. Like if I can see that all written out, we're good. So <laughs> Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And I think if you are an organized person, then kudos to you. But I've also noticed that people that tend to be creative, we kind of struggle with that other side of our brain. So for me as well, when I finally got signed to a management company, I was thanking Jesus because I was all over the place. And it was just, it was, it was me against myself, <laughs> keeping track of everything while also trying to maintain the creativity was a real struggle. So I would say you have to force yourself to be disciplined if you're not in that space of having someone behind you telling you and reminding you of all these different things, because at the end of the day, you will see the effect when it comes to your actual business and your monetization. So you have to be disciplined. I also, I started, um, I kind of have not necessarily a schedule for my actual content, but um, kind of like every Monday I do a couples challenge. Um, every Thursday I do something called trolls of the week. And then I have three days that I still need to figure out content. So what I try and do is I'll try and do maybe a dance trend one day and then I try, even if I don't have um, a brand deal or a collab with anybody that week, I'll try and do something more product based. So like a try on or like tasting food. So brands can see that, hey, she's funny. Uh, she has viral content, but she also can push product. Um, and then I usually do my own challenge. So that helps me out. So I'm not like freaking out every week being like, oh crap, what content am I going to post this week? It still happens. Like this week I am like, oh crap, but I did my Monday, <laughs> I did my Tuesday <laughs> and I know Thursday's trolls. We just got to figure out yeah. a the challenge. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that's very helpful. That's kind of like what I was speaking about when it comes to scripts or having different pillars of your brand where you know you're going to do the get ready with me. You're going to do the cooking. And you just stay consistent with that. And then you leave that wiggle room for you to explore and try new things. I love that. I, I think that that's like a very um, like tangible, easy way to conceptualize how to plan out content and how to, you're also setting expectations for your audience, right? Like I know, oh yeah, Trolls of the Week. Like I saw that last week and I was like, oh yeah, that's right. She does that every week. Um, so, you know, that, um, like having that kind of predictability is great for you. It's great for your audience, um, for everybody involved. That's a nice way to stay organized. I love that. Um, so we talked a little bit about brand deals. Let's dive in a little deeper. Um, what do you think are some of the big pitfalls that newbie creators should like watch out for uh, when they are first approached, when they're trying to negotiate for the first time? Um, if you can think of any red flags or like common problems that we can help folks avoid, let's do everything we can to prepare them. <laughs> I know this was definitely a struggle for me, especially when I first, first, first started. I remember it being like 1 a.m. and I saw an email come in that said she in something, something. So I'm like, oh, she in. Oh my God. They're like major. That's big money. And I started reading the email, a lot of grammatical errors. And then I was like, you know what? Let me actually look where this is coming from. And it said she and at gmail.com. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't think that this is what they're saying. But then they start getting crafty. And sometimes it really looks like it is something legit when it is a scam. And even to this day, I'll send something into my manager and she'll be like, sorry that's a scam. <laughs> so I think we have to be very vigilant and take precaution and just take note 
as to what they're asking you to do in order for you to not end up getting hurt. I hadn't even thought about scams. I, I just thought like, oh, you know, like not a good- It's not deal. wanting to pay you. Yeah, yeah that, that's a good, that's a really good red flag. I love that. I still, I still definitely get those. And I'm like, ooh, this is cool. And my <laughs> agents are like, Molly, that's a scam. I'm like, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> I already saw that. <laughs> um, I think a hard part is the industry, I feel like is such a, I don't know, it's like this weird secretive thing. And so you can search so many different places of like, how much um, am I worth with this many followers? This And you get such a variety of like, this is how much you should be getting paid. This is how much you should ask for. So like I said before, I was trying to kind of do this by myself. Number one, I'm not good at pushing myself. I I think everybody should be better at that. I wish I was like knowing my worth. Like, yeah, you got to pay me to do this crap. Because at first, you know, I'm like, ooh, you're going to pay me that much? Great. And then when I really got into it, I was like, that was nothing. Okay, cool. <laughs> but um, so it's like, know your worth, uh, do your research. Um, and I've, I've heard somebody say, you can always ask for quite a bit. They're never going to, if they're wanting to work with you, you ask for a big price. They're never going to be like, mm, never mind. We're not going to work with you. You know, they're going to try and negotiate a deal and go back and forth for a while. But like I said, they're never just gonna be like, oh, you asked for too much. You think you're pretty cool. We're out, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I've heard of a couple of stories where that actually has happened but like it always reflects so poorly on the brand that they're doing that to the creator um and like I don't know it's tricky because you're working with people who naturally have like a megaphone a public platform where they're able to say anything they want about your brand so like I don't know I would be pretty careful in like burning that bridge. I mean, I always say creators are a resource for a brand. They are a valuable, valuable resource that can do amazing, amazing work. You don't want to burn that bridge. But even if the deal doesn't work out, you don't, you don't want to give anybody, you know, like cannon fodder, right? <laughs> um, but I love that you said uh, knowing your worth, because that was like literally word for word in my next question. Um, I'm interested to know, um, how you have kind of navigated as your platforms have grown, starting to request higher and higher rates, um, knowing your worth, right? And especially if it's a brand that you've worked with in the past and you're going back and saying, yeah, I wanna work with you again, but things have changed. So here's here's the new number. Um, how do you recommend people like start, you know, trying to gain confidence in that realm? Um, for me, that's a tough one because I've, I've also struggled with that. And I mean, I feel like at the end of the day, we have all the tools that we need in order to craft that email. And it's not like we have to speak to them in person. So you can undo and redo that email as much as you can. You just have to press the send button and you never know unless you ask. And the worst that they can say is no. You really have nothing to lose, to be honest. Do you agree? Yeah, I was. I had something in my brain and then it totally just went away. It was pretty cool though. <laughs> I can't think of it. <laughs> if it comes back, pop it and let right? us know. Um, and how do you kind of like, start setting those new benchmarks for yourself like is it oh I've reached this many followers or I've had this many videos with a consecutive over 500,000 likes or like whatever what are kind of your parameters for success in your own mind and when you feel like you've reached a new threshold where it's like okay now it's time for brands to get even more competitive with with what what we're negotiating here yeah um oh. I I think a lot of it is kind of like supply and demand. Like um, for some reason, my May and June were really busy. And so um, I was able to like, just kind of pick and choose 
you know, who's going to pay more, what's worth my time. And so I think just being open and honest, being like, especially, you know, Q4 is going to be a huge one. And I think you can definitely raise your rates then because everybody's going to be wanting to work with you and advertising and be like, I'm worth a little bit more than that for now. And I, oh, I do remember what I was going to say. Yes. Yay. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I had a hard time knowing my worth with this and being like, you know, seeing the money and I'm like, I like, am I really worth that much money? But the train of thought now that I always remember is there are no longer commercials. I mean, there are, but nobody's watching TV. Your marketing for businesses are coming from social media. So I'm like, I'm probably way cheaper than making a whole dang commercial. So there you go. A hundred percent. That's like one of the, one of the values that we tout, like as a, a platform that enables creators and brands to find each other and partner more effectively um, we're, we always like stress that, that element of it. And actually I was talking, um, with like an agency a couple of days ago and they wanted to start talking about like black Friday, cyber, cyber Monday. Now I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. Let's, let's get like way out ahead of it. Um, and they brought up something that I hadn't even thought of, which was, this is an election year, which means that those traditional, um, like more traditional marketing channels, are like gonna be so saturated and all of the prices are gonna be inflated. And that means that there's a ton of opportunity, I think for influencers and creators across the board um, because it is generally more cost-effective because they're basically outsourcing everything to you. Doing the script, you are the talent so they don't have to pay actors or actresses individually for that. And you're producing it. Like you're you're literally filming it or, or taking the photographs or whatever it is. Um, so there's a ton of opportunity there, but it is, it is very much a closed environment as far as I can tell. Like we even as a service provider, we find some of our like uh, content that performs the best is like people looking to understand what rates because they don't know, they really don't know what the benchmarks are and what they should be offering to be compelling. Um, so anyway, I don't know if either of you have anything you want to piggyback on with that. Um <laughs> Um, to answer the original question, I feel like they do work in tandem. And when you first start, I feel like the benchmark is, okay, I want to get 50K, 80K, 100K followers, not realizing that you have to keep your engagement up and that brands are looking at your engagement more than they are looking at your following. Is it nice to have that huge following? Absolutely. But if you have a million followers, but only 10,000 views on your videos, they're going to know that something is up. So you always have to keep it in your mind. How do I build my community so that my engagement matches my following? Absolutely. That's a, that's a really, really great point. Um, and it's like, you know, the same issue that you see with some like channels that have like bot account followers, you know, it's like those, those are customers. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, they might be there for a vanity metric, but they're not going to convert. They're not going to actually go out and buy that that um, company's products or services. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, speaking of value, do you think that like going viral actually produces value for brands in the long run? Or do you think that that's more of like an audience building vehicle? It depends. I would say... It is predominantly more so for audience building, but if you went viral because you tried this makeup brush that applied in, uh, insanely well on your face, best believe that makeup brush is going to sell out. <laughs> so I think it really depends on the type of content that you're creating. If you decide to take what I would call the easy route and do dance trends, that is for audience building. You're not really selling anything unless, I don't know, the sweatpants you had on was just so gorgeous and people had to know where it was from. But if it wasn't, then yeah. I agree. I, I started, like I said, just for fun. And it was a lot of viral videos and viral. And um, when I started wanting to monetize, I was like, companies aren't seeing their product in these videos. Like we're doing couples challenges, dance videos, trends. I was like, and that's why I have once, once a week, even if it's not paid, I will do a little haul or review some product on Amazon. 
And that shows brands that, oh, like she can go viral, yes. But I don't think that's, like you said, I think that's more of an audience bringing them to your page. I mean, it does help that, I mean, overall views usually, because if you go viral, your other views are going to go up. Um, but I don't know if it brings that much value in brand deals. Yeah, um, I actually really love that that answer because I think a lot of brands think that, oh, well, I just need a viral video and then we'll be we'll be good to go. Um, I think there are some people, marketers, who are literally given that mandate, like go make something viral happen. Um, and that's that's not necessarily where the true value is. And like one of the ways that we see that all the time is like sometimes smaller creators who have like really deep connections with their followings, like actually convert better um, because they're able to respond to comments more easily. The audience feels more engaged. They feel like there's a real relationship there. And so there's deeper levels of trust. Um, whereas like, you know, a Kardashian or whatever, yeah, they have millions and millions of followers, but like, do you think that the followers really feel like they're friends? Like probably not, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, uh, you, you keep leading naturally into my next question, which is talking about like the balance between organic and paid content. Um, because we, we do know that the more sponsored content you post, that's like obviously a brand deal or it has hashtag ad or whatever. Um, people are like, Oh, here we go. You know? Um, so how do you, do you, have like hard and fast rules do you aim for a certain amount of sponsored versus organic content a week a month how do you kind of attack that um for me i pretty much let it flow to be honest but what i wouldn't do is post like back to back paid content so if i know this is going to be a busy week and i have quite a few things to post now i'm super active on my page and i'm giving you that organic content in between to kind of break it up so you don't feel like this page is just for ria to sell stuff to me agreed i i try not to go like back to back in like my stories with um paid ads um, cause your, your engagement's just going to go down. People tend to see that it's an ad and they just scroll on. So you got to have some kind of engaging content, even in stories. Like there's, there's certain things that'll, they want to give their opinion on things. So if you let your audience give you an opinion, no matter what, um, you will get your engagement will rise. So I try and do something if, that I've seen previously work more for engagement in between those stories. So it's like, oh, let me get my engagement up and then pop them with another story, <laughs> another story ad. And I also try and do um, only like one paid reel a week. So okay. try is a big word. I mean, sometimes <laughs> it's just like, I've got all these deals, we've got to figure it out, but I try and space them out. Well, that's interesting though, because I feel like you're both basically saying, if I have a lot of brand deals that I need to squeeze into one period of time, that means I just also have to really up my organic content to to balance it out, which feels, it feels like that could work. Uh, maybe not like super sustainably long-term because you don't want to like burn yourself out, but you also have to have room in your schedule where, you know, when the deals come through the door, you know, you have bills to pay and you want to yep. keep those relationships alive. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So this, this entire webinar series is called creator business bootcamp because we're trying to make sure that creators who maybe are a little earlier in their journey or who have burning questions, um, can learn from other top creators, industry professionals, talent managers, all of that good stuff. And one of the things that I think is really interesting to kind of dabble in is the financial side. I think creators generally, I mean, creator is the name, the title, like that means you're creative, you know, how to, um, you know, create engaging pieces of content for people to consume. But like the business side of it, I think is a little more elusive. So I'm interested to know, um, you know, I know you both have management, so I'm sure that helps, but do you have any tools that you currently use or maybe you used earlier um on in your journey to help you like from the financial side like keeping track of stuff did you have a google sheet did you like use some sort of software like how do you how do you handle that 
Um, like I said earlier, I need help with this stuff. Like I said, I am not good. I have never ran a business. I don't know financial stuff. You know, I've been a stay at home mom for eight years up until now. Um, and so like I said, get help, but for, at first, you know, you're not making money quite yet. And it's, so it's scary to, to hire help or pay for stuff because you don't quite see the value in it. There is value in it. If you're not spending time worrying about taxes or your accounts or um, that sort of stuff, you have more time to be creative, to do what you're good at content creation, and they can handle what they're good at. Um, I do know at first, I, I do now have like an accountant. I have my campaign manager who helps me stay organized with my brand stuff. Um, but at first with taxes, that's kind of scary because nothing's taken out yet. And so anytime I got paid by a brand, I would just put half straight in savings and just this, we don't touch this. Cause I was like, I have no clue when tax season comes, how much I'm going to owe, especially when you first start. So that definitely helped me because it was a little bit of a sticker shock when you first hit taxes that first year. Yeah, um, I absolutely agree with that as well. Um, but I think if you are like a fresh, fresh, fresh influencer, content creator, and you're trying to figure out your way around brand deals and you know what to say, what not to say, I feel like building your community of other content creators is something that can be very helpful for you because a lot of times they might've worked with that particular company. They might be in talks with them right now, or they might've done something that's fairly similar. So you can kind of bounce your thoughts and ideas off of them. And they can tell you, I think you're offering, I think you're, you're saying you're selling yourself short. Or maybe say this, or make sure you add, you you charge them for exclusivity and whitelisting. They've been there before you, and you can gain a lot of knowledge if you surround yourself with those kinds of people. And a lot of times they do want to help, to be honest. I agree with that. There's That's how I started monetizing, because I met with a group and heard all of the stuff they were doing, and I was like, what the crap have I been doing this whole time? Like, it's just, like I said, it's kind of an elusive world, but if you surround yourself and honestly, there's space for all of us in this content creation world. Like you just see endless amounts of, of influencers and content creators. And we're all, we're all kicking butt. Like it's not that we don't need to hide anything. We don't need to, you know, the brands that come to you are different than the brands that are coming to your friends. So I agree. Helping yourself out or each other out and mm -hmm. talking to other creators is a wonderful idea. And they probably count on us not talking to each other either. So yeah, they probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I just love that so much. Like the the sense of community, the like you know um, the like solidarity is just like so inherent in this side of the business, and I love that. And you you are shining examples of that because you're here to help other people learn from your experiences. So um, big old hearts to you both. <laughs> um, before we dive into the Q&A, and I did see a couple of questions come through, so that's great. Um, I just wanted to like kind of wrap things up by asking you each, let's say um, a sibling, a best friend, a parent, somebody comes to you and they say, hey, I just had this video go viral overnight what do I do? What's your like number one top of mind piece of advice for that person? Me? Do it again. <laughs> I was going to say, stay consistent. Like keep, if this is something you're interested in, just keep posting those videos, make sure they're you, they're not forced. They're not what you see somebody else doing. Make it you keep trying. You got this. Yes. If you can actually take the time to post for like, and I didn't do this, but I wish I did take the time to post for maybe like two weeks straight, put yourself on a challenge, just post whatever comes to your mind, whatever pops up, just let it out, let it flow. I guarantee you at least one of those videos will go viral again. Yes. And don't, well, I don't guarantee it, but <laughs> <laughs> don't overthink things. I remember when I first started some of the, and still to this day, when I'm like, I don't have anything. I get on there. I throw something out there. Sometimes that's like, it's usually the, my dumbest stuff. And it, a lot of it goes viral. Like, just don't overthink it. It doesn't have to be a certain way. It doesn't, if you think of something, just post it. If it doesn't do well, oh, well, 
but there could be a big chance that that thing that you just came up with on a dot is gonna go viral so yeah and it it's full circle to what you kind of started out saying about like being authentic and being you like that's why people are there is to like see the unadulterated you like that's what they're drawn to right um so you don't want to like try and like add extra like professional whatever like you need to be who you are I think to kind of keep that momentum going yeah um beautiful okay well I think we're ready to dive into the Q&A um First big question I see here is, what do you do if you've gone viral for a video that is unrelated to the kind of content you are trying to put out? I went viral from a video of the eclipse, but my account is all about home design content. I would tell you what not to do, and that is don't become an eclipse scientist and keep posting a whole bunch of stuff about the eclipse. Um, just try to pivot. I feel like we've all kind of been there where we went viral for something that we didn't really care to go viral for. And I would say just, just try your best to engage that audience as much as you can. Maybe the next video can be you talking about what you did on the day of the eclipse. Like, I don't know, try to, to just inch them away, but still keeping them in the realm. Yeah, but I mean, they came to your page because of the viral video, but they'll stick around if they like that sort of niche. So I would just say stick with it. I mean, if you can pull something in from the eclipse, like she said, I don't know, design something around your house <laughs> the feeling of the eclipse or how you felt or something like that I don't know I definitely am not a home designer so I can't help you with that one too much <laughs> I mean and I, I think um I think it is an opportunity like if you have a video I, I think that's pretty common that a lot of creators end up going viral for something that is not their main content and then they have to scramble and figure out okay how do I keep this going but I think the the general idea is like sometimes lightning will strike like that. And it is a little bit of a challenge to figure out how to do that. But people came to you. They know who you are. Hopefully they followed your channel. They engaged with your content, which means the algorithm is going to show you to them again. So keep posting. Definitely don't stop posting and just keep being who you are. And yeah, maybe you won't like have the same like, you know, straight line trajectory um, but that doesn't mean that you're not seeing success. And also for, I think most creators, especially when they're starting out and not monetize, they're making content because they love to do it. And so I think a lot of people have a dream of reaching, you know, superstardom on social media and getting all these brand deals and basically being paid to, to just make, you know, fun videos from home, but it is a job. It's not like, it's not like it doesn't require any work. Um, and you know, it, it takes a long time for some people to really like get to where they want to be. So don't give up, keep, keep plugging away at it. Um, and stay con consistent. That's, uh, what our friends here have kept saying. And I think it's a hundred percent true. Um, all right. Next, uh, question is about equipment. Do you think viewers know it's an ad when they see you have a microphone clip to you? Do you always use a microphone? Um, because if I don't, I have a lot of echo. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely not. Because I feel like people use microphones just to make the quality of their content better. It has absolutely nothing to do with ads. And um, at least in my experience, I don't think I've ever seen a microphone and assumed this must be an ad. I think that the person is trying to level up their content by using it. Yeah. And I think, think it seriously. Yeah. I think if um, you're a person that uses the microphone often, then it, no, people aren't going to think anything different. If I started using one randomly in an ad, they might be like, I've never seen her use one in my life. Like, what is that? So maybe if, I mean, if you're always using it, I don't think they're going to think anything different of it. And maybe use it in your organic content before you yeah. use it in an ad, um, yeah. especially to try it out. Make sure everything sounds good. You don't have any you know, issues with it. Um, and that way you're kind of soft launching uh, equipment upgrades to your audience. So it's not a big surprise when you get a big brand deal. How do those who do not yet have agents get brand deals and how do we assess worth? So 
um, maybe think back to like your first brand deal. Did you have management when you got your first brand deal? How did that kind of come about? No, um, for my first brand deal, I do believe the company reached out to me, but those were far and few. Um, I think the best way to do it is for you to engage with whoever it is that you want a brand deal from. And it doesn't have to be as scary as you always emailing them. You can simply DM the page, just letting them know that you love them. Tag them whenever you use your whenever you use their products. Just letting them know you exist in subtle ways, I think can lead to a brand deal eventually. Yeah. And I still do that with my manager. If there's something I really love, I'm going to be posting it in my stories organically. I'm going to tag them and then you can just slide into the DMs and they're going to see like, hey, she's tagged us this many times. Like this isn't something she's coming to us just because she's like, hey, I want I want this deal. This is something she really likes. She's really passionate about. Like, let's figure out a way to work together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there are other ways that you can do that too. Like one is you, you know, you already have the contact information or you slide into their DMs on social, but often at brands that are larger, like if it's not a really, really small up and coming startup kind of situation, whoever's running their social media team probably isn't in charge of like the brand deal side of things, like the influencer marketing. So you can try sliding into DMs, but if that doesn't work, go on LinkedIn and see if you can find somebody who has a title at that company that seems like maybe they are in charge of partnerships. Um, another way to tackle it is you can try doing some affiliate stuff first. So like if they have a presence on TikTok shop or Amazon, um, you can start earning commissions by promoting those products that way and then like level up and say, hey, look, I talked about this product and look at, you know, the sales I generated, we should talk about like an actual flat fee type of collaboration or, or something seasonal or something like that. Um, and then finally, you know, little shameless plug, Impact actually enables creators to start that conversation. So you can go to app.impact.com and create an account. And if you meet certain criteria, like you have to have a minimum of a thousand followers on one of our like main social media platforms, and we do have a team that manually vets um, creators to make sure that like, you know, it's not a bot account or something like that. Um, but once you're like approved, you go into our marketplace and then brands can find you very easily. They, they can look based on location, like a million different criteria and find you and reach out. But you can also reach out to brands. You can shop and see what brands have campaigns already live that might be a good fit and apply to them. You can start a DM with them on, on our platform and say, hey, I'm interested in partnering to get collaborations coming up. Can you, you know, keep me in mind? Here's my media kit um, and start the conversation that way. And for creators, it's 100% free. So no risk there. So go check that out. Um, question here, what do you use to measure your engagement rate? That's interesting. I think it also varies by platform. So I'm interested to know kind of how you conceptualize that. Um, I do it the traditional way, which is looking at the views, the likes, the comments, and all of that stuff. I particularly do really like reading my comments, though, to see what it is about the video that captured that captured people's attention. But um, I feel like based on my growth with my followers, I kind of have a set number of views that if I see it, I understand, okay, my video has done well, or this one was a flop. So yeah, and it changes your, as you grow. Yeah. And your stories, I feel like a big thing is views because um, those will shift a lot. And if you're doing something engaging, you know, those views are going to go up. If you're having people respond to you, if you're you know, wanting their opinion on something, your views will go up because people are engaging with that story. So I try and focus a lot on that. Um, and then I also, just to help my engagement, every time I post a video, I spend like 20 minutes on Instagram and 20 minutes on TikTok responding to those first commenters. It's hard sometimes, but I think it proves that, oh, she is here. She's listening. It might not be for long, but you <laughs> they do see that you're, hey, you're, you're seeing this and you're responding to these comments. And you can even just go through and like some of the comments. Like, People love to see that you're engaging back with them, not just them coming to you. 
And I think that feeds the algorithm as well. I mean, I'm not an expert on that, but I believe that if you engage more with commenter, you're more likely to be preferred um, on future pieces of content. So it's just a good practice if you if you can keep up with it. Obviously, it can become a full time job, especially if you do go viral. <laughs> but <laughs> yes. um, yeah. And I would also say, try to start conversations under your comments too. So if someone is asking you something and you know you can go a little bit in depth, I love seeing when I responded to someone and it turns into like four responses after that. <laughs> I think that's probably really good for engagement as well. Yeah, absolutely. My goodness, I just looked, we have 37 questions. So uh, we'll try and get to like another couple before we we finish up here. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you think hashtags matter? And do you think your videos get lost if you use really big hashtags that like everybody uses to try and, you know, bait the algorithm? I've had a very love hate relationship with hashtags. <laughs> so I've had experiences where I would use it and the video would go nuts. And I'll be like, yes, the hashtags are working. Use the exact same ones. And it's like, Womp, womp, womp. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a place where I'm not really using them because I've had plenty of videos go viral with absolutely not one hashtag in sight. I think it all comes down to did your video capture them within the first few seconds? That's it. I also don't use hashtags that much, but I do know that if you're trying to trick the system and you have some video and you're putting Taylor Swift and there's nothing to do with Taylor Swift, you might get dinged for it. So they might actually end up hurting you if you're trying to be like, oh, I want to get this out here. I'm going to put, you know, viral or it's not going to help. So if you do use hashtags, make them make sense with your video. Yeah, I fully agree. I think um, another good way to use hashtags, at least from like, you know, the technology side of things is to make yourself more discoverable. So like on our platform, if a brand wants to find creators who are talking about specific content, they can search for a hashtag. So it's almost like a location tag, right? Like it just helps them understand the relevance a little bit more and identify people who are talking about things that matter to them in their brand. So I think it's a good practice, but putting like, you know, uh, what was that one on ABC, XBY or whatever that one was on TikTok for a while or like FYP smiley face or whatever. Like that's not, that's probably not going to do anything. It, it, I don't know. I, I can't say that for certain, but I don't think that that's necessarily going to ensure that you show up on the FYP, if that makes sense. Um, all right. I think we have time for one more question. Um, what do you do if you've been denied multiple times by like, you know, several brands, like how do you, how do you kind of um, tailor your pitches or whatever to, to try and get their attention and, and uh, encourage them to choose you as a partner? Um, well, I think you keep going number one, but number two, I would say show them what you're worth. So that can be you once again, constantly using them in your content, but also getting something like a LTK and having that permissions link so you can send people to purchase it. And then when you go back to email them, now you have a little leg to stand on. I posted you in all of these videos. This was the views. This was the, the amount of likes, the comments. And also I have this link. It shows that I sold 50 products. So it gives them some sort of metrics to metrics for them to work off of. So they're like, okay, maybe this girl would be a good investment. I agree with that. Just chilling that you can use it organically. And um, I know I had kind of an issue with that when I first started. I was like, you know, I can show all this stuff, but nobody is buying what I'm showing. Number one, you've got to stay true to what you actually like. You got to, you can't just say yes to every brand deal because it's bringing in money. Um, you've got to build trust with your followers. If you're just throwing everything out there, like I've had so many supplement companies come to me and want brand deals. And I'm like, I can't be sitting here being like, oh, I take this one this day. And this one, like your followers are gonna be like, what the crap? You're just like full of supplements. Like <laughs> you gotta be super just like, I don't know how to say it particular. Okay. About, yeah. Yeah. What you're, what you're putting out there. And it is going to take some time to build that trust. It, it took me a couple, a year 
to where I actually am seeing the convert conversions because people have to be like, oh, I trust her recommendations. Like it, they're not going to just be like, oh, I just started following her. I like her. I'm going to buy this. They're, they, they've they got to know you. They've got to be like, she tells us you've got, you've also got to show things you don't like, you know, because people are not going to believe you if you just get on here and say, oh, I like this. I like this. I like this. So time, sometimes I will do like a try on haul and make sure I focus on something I don't like because people are going to be like, oh, she's only showing us stuff that she likes. Like that can't be true. You can't just like everything. So it's just a matter of being truthful, building that community, building their trust. A hundred percent. I love that. Um, and I think that is a beautiful note for us to finish up on. Thank you both so, so much. This has been so insightful. The comments, the questions and the Q and A are amazing. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to address some of those in like a future blog post or something. So uh, to all of our amazing attendees, thank you so much for being here. We will do our best to answer uh, some of the other top questions that we didn't have time to get to um, during the live Q and A today. Um, on Tuesday, July 30th, mark your calendars. We are going to have our next uh, Creator Business boot camp, which is going to be a pitch simulator. So we're gonna have a brand, a talent manager, and a creator all here to talk about uh, negotiating and how to uh, present yourself in the best possible light for brands. So uh, mark your calendars, keep your eye out for that. And thank you, thank you again to Molly and Rhea. You've been incredible. We're so grateful to have you here. And uh, we hope to collaborate again in the future. So please don't be strangers.